you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Exodus chapter 20. We're in uh, verse 14 today. Still looking at the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 14. And if you're there, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Exodus 20, 14. You shall not commit adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I'm just going to go right out there and say it. Uh, this is, might be a little bit awkward for you, but imagine how much more awkward it is for me. So let's just get this out of the way. I won't be saying sex a lot, uh, and we're going to be talking about it in a pretty frank manner. So if that makes you uncomfortable, too bad. Because here we go. Uh, when, <laughs> whenever uh, I was a kid, you know, I used to get really grossed out when I saw my parents making out. I think all kids do. They're like, oh, what is that? What are you doing? You know? And even today, my sister, it, it's, it's a funny thing because like, now we, we bring it up just to make her uncomfortable because she still just gets really uncomfortable when, when thinking about that. But... God has given sex as a gift. It's a wonderful thing that he's given us to celebrate. And that's what this commandment is all about. And we can see God's design for sex in the very beginning of the Bible. Look with me at Genesis 1. And by the way, just letting you know, we go a lot of places in the Bible today. So I would just be ready to flip whenever... uh, as you're able. Uh, Genesis 1, verse 28, God gives Adam and Eve what's called the cultural mandate. This is his blessing for all humanity. And so God, in verse 27, said, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then he says in verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Basically, what God's first blessing and command to his people were, to all humanity were, have babies and rule the earth. That's what he wanted his people to do. And we see it even more so the fact that the Bible celebrates sex as a gift in the very next chapter, just look over one page, chapter 2, looking at verses 23 and 24. This is where the Bible zooms in on God making Adam and Eve specifically. And Adam is put to sleep, and God creates Eve from his rib. And then it's, you know, have you ever been to a wedding? They always have those, those cute pictures now where the husband will turn around or the groom will turn around and sees the bride for the first time and they always try to capture that little that little moment this is what's happening here he turns and he sees eve and he just breaks out in poetry like life is some kind of musical and he says this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man how poetic He sees her and is immediately filled with love for her. But then the Bible uses that, and in the next verse, uses Adam's love for Eve, and then says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. He's pointing to the fact that men and women are designed to be in intimate sexual relationship with each other in this covenant of marriage. And that in this covenant, in this special relationship that God has given between a man and his wife, he gives this wonderful gift by which we can fulfill that cultural mandate to be fruitful and multiply and join together becoming one flesh. Sex is a gift, and the Bible is very pro-sex. In fact, I was reading one commentator, and he said that the Bible, while it's never pornographic, it is erotic, 
And if that makes you uncomfortable, it's probably because you're more prudish than God is. And it's really true. Look with me at the, the book of the Bible uh, we all tried to avoid when we were kids. <laughs> Song of Solomon, if it made you uncomfortable. Song of Songs. And just look at some of the things that this man and woman say to each other and about one another. Of course, this is a book that's about the love between a bride and a groom, between a man and his wife. He says in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, he says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. And then she replies, Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green. Which, I guess that was trendy back then. I don't know. And then go on to chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. He says, How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. And then probably most explicit, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, she says, I slept but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. Open to be my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew and my locks with the drop of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what they're talking about or what they're trying to go for. The Bible is very pro-sex. In fact, it sees it as a wonderful gift that should be enjoyed. In fact, sex is more than just made for having babies. It's more than just fulfilling the cultural mandate. And what's interesting, though, is that over the history of the church, many times sex has been viewed as something Negative. We see this most recently in the 90s, right? We see the whole purity movement of like sex is bad and that's why you shouldn't do it, which often created a lot of chaos for people who then got married and suddenly were told, okay, it's fine now, after being told it's terrible all those years. But we see that all throughout the history of the church, the early church fathers, many of them said that marriage and, and having sex within marriage was actually unnecessary. The only reason you should ever do it is in order to have babies. If you do it for any other reason, it's sinful. That's what they taught. And in fact, by the Middle Ages in the 1500s, around the time of Martin Luther, they had started saying, okay, well, here's certain days on the calendar where you're not allowed to have sex with one another. And by the time of the Protestant Reformation, that number was up to 180 days out of the year. That's a lot. And it took a long time for the church to go back to a biblical understanding of what sex is and what it's for. And we can see it here in this commandment. As Philip Ryken says, sex is not merely procreational, but also relational and even recreational. Sex is for love, for pleasure, and for joy. And it is in order to protect this joy that God has given us the seventh commandment. See, this is the heart behind the seventh commandment that we often miss. God doesn't just say to do this because he doesn't want you to have a good time. He's doing it because he wants men and women in the covenant of marriage to enjoy one another to the highest degree possible. God cares about your marriage. He cares about the relationship between husband and wife, and he wants to protect that. But our culture today, as you all know, completely dismisses that idea. In fact, the prevailing ideology in our culture today is that in order to have your highest joy, in order to be your best self, in order to really truly be able to please your wife later, you need to engage in all sorts of sexual activity. You need to explore and do whatever you want with whomever you want, however you want, with no consequences, 
so that you can be the most fulfilled person possible because at the end of the day, it's all about your pleasure. Hedonism has won in our culture today. But really, when we look at all the social issues, what it really boils down to is hedonism. Choosing our own pleasure over that of our morals. And so when somebody coming from that culture, and it might be someone in this room today, reads a commandment like, you shall not commit adultery, what they read is, oh, God doesn't want me to have a good time. When really what God's doing is like saying, hey, fish, stay in the river, because if you don't, you're going to die. And the fish jumps on the land because he doesn't want to be bound in by the riverbanks. And then what happens? Fish dies. God created this commandment as guardrails, not to keep you from having your best life, but so that you could have your best life, to give you that which you want most in your marriage, that highest joy of being in committed relationship, that wonderful deep trust that you have with one another, and celebrated through sexual intimacy. So let's look at what this command really is talking about. It says, you shall not commit adultery. We need to define what adultery is. Put really simply, adultery is just marital infidelity, being unfaithful to your spouse sexually. That's what it boils down to. If you go and sleep with another person whom you are not married to, you have committed adultery. And again, this command, the purpose of it is in order to protect marriage. God cares a lot about marriage. He cares a lot about husbands and wives staying together. In fact, he cares about it so much that in the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 10, he says this. Flip with me there. Leviticus 20, chapter, or verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Then you may be thinking, okay, whoa, hold on. Are you saying like a one-time tryst? Maybe like we don't know the, the outstanding circumstances. Maybe something was weird and happened. Maybe someone was drunk. You know, whatever it was, this is cause for them to be executed? And the answer is yes. Because often, and especially because of our culture today, we have so downplayed what adultery is that now it's actually encouraged often among people. We have sites like Ashley Madison which encourage men to go and commit affairs against their wives. But God doesn't see it that way. He cares so much about your marriage that he's willing to say, put them to death. And you might not be thinking that that's fair. But really, to commit adultery is to wound your partner in the deepest way possible. This is a person that you have made a covenant with before God that you will love forever, that you will be faithful to forever. You, those of you who are married know that there is a trust and a companionship that is built within marriage that is deeper than any other relationship we have aside from that of, with our Lord. With, there's no other person on this earth with whom we have a deeper relationship with. And then to take that trust and betray it, to take that gift that was meant just for you and to give it to somebody else is to wound your partner in the deepest way possible. Adultery really is the worst kind of sexual sin because it violates that trust and it breaks the covenant between a man and his wife. And you might be thinking, okay, well, I am not married, so does this apply to me? Yes, because as we've talked about before, God's law is not just the letter of the law. Every one of these commands is, stands for a category of sins that God wants us to abstain from. You know, when we see couples who are 
engaged, oftentimes they, they wonder where the line is. Like, how far can we go with one another before we've gone too far? And that's really the wrong question. The real question should be, how can we preserve our purity for one another? How can we it, preserve the purity of my spouse, my future spouse, so that we can have this highest joy together? And for those who aren't married or aren't about to be married, this also talks about and, and is included in all kinds of inappropriate intimacy. And this goes for those of us who are married as well. Inappropriate intimacy leads to adultery, right? Men, it is never appropriate for you to flirt with another woman who is not your wife, ever. I don't care if it's just for playing. I don't care if it's just because it's fun. It's inappropriate. Women, it is never okay to give all of your emotional baggage to another man who is not your husband. He is the person who's supposed to bear that burden with you, not somebody else. It's inappropriate. In fact, I would go so far as to say that for those of us who are not married, you probably shouldn't even try to be alone with somebody of the other uh, sex unless you're like on a date, right? Uh, Billy Graham had this rule that anytime he was going to meet with a woman, he would bring a third person with him, right? Group dates are great. Do group dates. But we should follow that today. You know, I was meeting, uh, I had to meet with somebody a few months ago, this young woman from uh, college, and we were going to meet at a coffee shop, and I asked her if I could bring my wife with me because I don't want to just meet with somebody one-on-one -on -one like that because I want to stay above reproach. And as men and women in the church, we should be all about staying above reproach. So that forbids us from engaging in these kinds of inappropriate intimacy that lead to adultery. Because when it comes down to it, you don't just wake up one day and decide you're going to commit an affair. It starts with little things. It starts with saying, okay, well, this person is more willing to listen to me than my husband is. So I'm going to tell that person about all my problems. And soon a relationship develops and it grows and grows and grows. And that eventually turns into a kind of intimacy that you were not intending in the beginning. Men, it might start with just a look. And then that look turns into focused attention and pursuit. And all of a sudden, it's escalated to a place that maybe you weren't intending at the beginning. Adultery starts in these places of inappropriate intimacy. And for those of us who are not married, it also forbids any kind of sexual immorality. What the New Testament word for is porneia, where we get our word pornography from. Sexual immorality is included in premarital sex. It's also uh, included in any other kind of sexual immorality that we can think of. And again, this is not being forbidden from us because God doesn't want us to have a good time. God's doing this because it's so good. See, sex, what it really is for is that it's the super glue of the marriage. You remember a few years ago, there was a woman who took super glue and thought she could use it as hairspray? And then she like emptied a whole can of like industrial strength super glue on her head. It's, it was crazy, y'all. If you didn't see it, go look it up. Her hair was like concrete, right? She had to like shave her entire head because there was no way to get it out. And in fact, the super glue company had to come out and say, just so you're aware, don't use our product as hairspray <laughs> because of how bad and how viral this went. Or maybe when you were growing up in school, you got to do projects and you got to uh, play with super glue. Did you ever have that friend who wanted to glue his fingers together and then realized that super glue actually meant super glue? <laughs> and it doesn't just come off real quickly. I remember when I was in school, we had this guy, he did, he glued his fingers together and he thought he could just rip it off and, and get them apart, like, you know, with regular glue. So he did, and skin went with it. <laughs> it ripped. Sex does the same thing. It's super glue, and when we share it with somebody else, we cause rips. It rips our souls. 
harms us. Not just them, but ourselves. God wants us to have sex because it keeps couples together. And in fact, the New Testament, Paul says that men and women should not keep themselves from one another. That the only exception should be a time where you're fasting so that you can pray. And then you come back quickly. And he, Paul even says, if you're single and you're unable to control yourself, go get married so that your passions don't lead you to sin. He wants, God wants us to have great sex. He wants us to be able to have that intimate relationship. And so he tells us to protect our marriages by not committing adultery. But there's a second facet to this as well. It's not just because he cares about our marriage, but because marriage in and of itself is a picture of God's relationship to his people. Sex is never just sex. It has a physical and emotional and a spiritual aspect to it. There is a connection between our sexuality and our spirituality. We're going through Hosea right now in the men's group. And what's so cool to see, what, what, what we saw is that God views his relationship with his people as that of a husband and a wife. In fact, the whole book of Hosea, it starts out by saying, uh, going to the prophet Hosea, God commands him, hey, go marry a woman who is sexually promiscuous, who's uh, in prostitution, so that I can show my people what it's like when they go and worship somebody else. He's very explicit with this because he wants them to understand that what they're doing and serving other gods is basically cheating on him. And in fact, he gets so explicit with this that in Hosea chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, he puts it like this. And I will sow her for myself in the land. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the wrong verse. Hold on. Can't read my own writing. 2, 14 through 16. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And then in 19 and 20, he says, And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. God's relationship with his people is a picture of marriage. That's why God wants to protect marriage so much because marriage is not just about marriage. It's about God. It's a picture of our relationship with our Creator. So whenever we sin sexually, we are sinning against our God. Not just because we're breaking a command, but because we're taking that picture and we're breaking it. We're dishonoring God. The book of Ephesians actually puts it in even more stark contrast. Ephesians chapter 5 is a classic passage on marriage. Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 32. I'm going to read this whole thing. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church 
and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he gives this kicker in verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Your marriage is more about just than just God's relationship with His people. It's a picture of Christ and His church. So when we commit adultery, we're profaning that as well. Every act of spiritual immorality is a kind of spiritual desecration. 1 Corinthians 6, 13-17 Paul writes to this church, and this church had real struggles with sexual immorality. If you've ever been, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Corinth, it's really interesting to see it brings this book to life because in this book, in this city, is it's a small city, and in the very middle is a high mountain. At the top was a temple to Aphrodite, and every person in that city prior to coming to Christ would go up that hill and worship by having sex with religious prostitutes in that temple all the time. And so you can imagine the kind of spiritual baggage that they brought after coming to Jesus. And so Paul is quick to correct them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13-17. through 17, He says this, Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. And then he goes on in verses 17 through 20. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So what we've seen the Bible's pretty clear about is that the sexual union between a man and his wife is about the relationship between God the Father and His people, between Jesus and His church, and the Holy Spirit in our own bodies. And when we sin sexually, when we commit adultery, we betray the Father, the Son, and spirit. What we do with our bodies directly affects our relationship with God. Adultery hurts others and dishonors God himself. So again, like last week, we could say, so don't do it. Don't commit adultery. Sermon's over. But Jesus doesn't let us do that because he taught on adultery and he showed us that this isn't just about a group of sins that we're not supposed to commit outwardly, but also about our inward understanding of where adultery comes from. Look with me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about adultery, and then he takes it to the heart of the matter. He says in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. 
But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So adultery is more than just the act. All sin, regardless of what it is, begins in the heart. It begins internally, and as we focus on it, as the book of James says, when we get those evil desires and then we focus on them and keep them in our mind, it turns into action every time. And Jesus is saying it's not enough to simply just not do adultery. You must also not commit adultery in your heart. This is something that, by the way, Jews today still struggle with. I was listening to a, uh, a seminar in which some Jewish people were talking about adultery, and they believe it's perfectly fine to watch pornography because it keeps men from committing physical adultery, as if that makes sense. They reject this teaching of Jesus. And in fact, I, I would say most of our culture does. But Jesus is very clear. He takes the law to the heart of the matter, and the heart of the matter is our heart. As I said, we live in a hyper-sexualized culture. I was reading in the news the other day that Netflix now has several shows with full frontal nudity in ways that are, have only previously ever been seen in pornographic films. But now it's just part of the show. Increasingly, shows are becoming more and more and more sexual. In fact, statistics show us that uh, at baseline, 65% of all men from ages 18 to 75 watch pornography at least monthly. One study found that it was 91% of the people in their study group. Among women, not much better. 45%. One in three Americans looks at pornography at least monthly, not mentioning those who view it regularly. Sexual addiction, the, the last statistics that we've seen, is that roughly 11% of the entire United States is addicted to pornography. And pornography is only that which is easiest for us to find. There are tens of thousands of sexual images that are thrown at us all the time. Back in 1997, a man came before Congress and he testified saying that our children are exposed to at minimum 10,000 sexual images a year. That was in 97. How much more now? Our culture is completely awash in sexual immorality. And it would be easy for us to blame the culture and say, that's the problem. We need to fix that. But Jesus doesn't do that because he understands that regardless of what the culture does, we still act on it. You make your own choices. Sin comes not from your culture, but from you. Lust comes from the heart, and lust leads to adultery. Now, again, to define lust, it, it really just means to look at somebody and imagine the sexual possibilities, whatever that might be. And he says, if you look at somebody with lustful intention, you have already in your heart committed adultery. The seventh commandment requires the preservation of our own and our neighbor's chastity. It's not enough just to not commit adultery. It requires us to be about the purity of ourselves and our neighbors. When we remember that this commandment comes in the section of loving our neighbor as ourself, one way that we show love to our neighbor is by being chaste ourselves and helping our neighbors also 
not fall into sexual temptation. Uh, for a long time, that's meant women dressing uh, modestly and men choosing not to just ogle women, right? To treat them with respect instead of treating them as objects. The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it like this, that the Seventh Commandment requires the preservation of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, speech, and behavior. It's not enough just to not watch porn. It also includes telling those dirty jokes or having the locker room talk. It also includes what we wear. It also includes how we speak to one another, how we treat one another. This affects every one of us because every one of us in some way has broken this law. Maybe even this week you have broken this law in some way. Ephesians 5, again, speaks on this. Verses 3 and 4. It says this, the sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. See, God doesn't let us get by with those little things. He wants us to be a people whom when, God, when people look at God's people, they say, Sexual immorality is not even named among them. They won't even tell a bad joke. They won't even do the locker room talk when the women aren't around. Why? Because all of it is a form of sexual immorality. And every bit of it is evil. But you might be thinking, well, listen, even if I am lusting, that's not really affecting anybody else. There's no victim here. I'm not taking action on it. What's the problem? Well, giving in to lust does have lasting consequences. When I was young, on the way to school, we used to read a chapter of the book of Proverbs every day on the way to school, and it's caused the Proverbs to stick in my head in a way that few other books of the Bible have. And one that's always stuck with me is Proverbs 6, verses 25 through 27. Do not desire her beauty in her heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? What he's saying here is sex is meant for a good purpose. But when we take that thing and we put it where it's not supposed to be, it causes huge amounts of damage. In the same way that when we go camping or we, we're sitting in front of a warm fire, it's good and delightful and we enjoy the heat and the warmth it provides, the marshmallows and the hot dogs we toast over it, and just the beauty of looking at the flame, but then take that and throw it in an open field and see people's houses destroyed and lives lost, all because of where it is. It will not leave you alone. In fact, again in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the disaster that living a lustful, sexually immoral life leads to. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. He says this, Hold on. I think it's 1 Corinthians 6. My bad. I'm really bad at reading my writing today, y'all. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 6, 
9 and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. God says that sexual immorality leads to death. You will not inherit eternal life if you lead a sexually immoral life. Hebrews 13.4 puts it this way, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. It leads to judgment. It leads to death. Thankfully, Jesus has done something about it. Those verses in 1 Corinthians are often quoted when we want to point out all the bad things that people do to lose eternal life, and then we forget verse 11. Look again, 1 Corinthians 6. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus has given us grace because he has done something about our sin on the cross. He has taken all of our sexual immorality and he's put it on himself so that lusty, sexually immoral followers of Jesus could be in relationship with him. Listen, if you have committed sexual immorality in any way, God calls you to repent. Also, offers you grace. In the church today, sexual immorality is sometimes viewed as that unforgivable sin. That one thing that if that person does it, lose all credibility, they can never be redeemed in the church. There's no way for you to sin your way out of the love of God. He has given grace because in his love for you he died in your place Jesus was showing us that example when we see the Pharisees bring him a woman who's caught in adultery they catch this woman and and remember following the law they should have brought the man as well but they, they leave the man for some reason they just bring this woman who've been caught in adultery, and they come up to Jesus and they say, the law says we should kill this person, what do you say? And they're trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus tells them he is without the sin, cast the first stone. And one by one, starting with the older men, they leave. Because they realize they're just as sinful, they just hadn't been caught. And the woman looks around, Jesus looks up, and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one to accuse you? And she says, no. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Jesus gives us grace. But that's not where Jesus stopped talking. He told the woman, now go and sin no more. For those of us who struggle with sexual immorality, Jesus offers you grace time and time again. But he also wants you to repent. Turn and sin no more. Turn away from your sin. In fact, next week we're going to talk a little bit more about resisting temptation because I just realized that we're 43 minutes in and I'm about halfway done. (laughs) So we're going to end it there today. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. Thank you for showing us your law and the fact that you have grace for us. And God, we freely admit that we have sinned against you in multiple ways. Every one of us has broken this law. But God, you've given us grace. So Lord, I pray that now you would show us those places in our hearts and our minds where we have sinned against you, where we have committed adultery in our hearts or maybe even have actually committed adultery. 
Father, would you help us to repent? Would you help us turn away from those sins? And help us walk in the newness of life. Jesus, now I pray that in these next moments of silence, you would show us those places in our hearts where we have sinned against you. Where we have sinned against our spouse. Against our future spouse. And against ourselves. And I pray that you would help us to confess. God, your word says that when we confess our sins to you, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, now having confessed our sins, I pray that you would help us to turn from our sin and sin no more. Help us walk faithfully with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.